I'm online. Is the ah, font yes, size good. okay? Fit the win yeah, my screen is okay. Not super okay. large, but it's uh it's doable. Okay. So okay. welcome everybody. This is uh this is uh slot number two of uh, week number three of the KTH DevOps course, and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Julien Biscondi. Uh, he's an old friend of the KTH DevOps course. Uh, Julien is a senior software engineer uh, and no, so, uh, no uh, site reliability engineer. Uh, MLOps engineer, Julien has many, many skills uh, in the Stockholm uh, Swedish industry, um, software industry. Uh, and and Julien, today we'll talk about uh, containers. Julien, we would like to thank you for accepting to be a guest lecturer. It's really an honor uh, for, for KTH uh, to have you as a guest lecturer today. Um, as usual, it's a 45 minute slot. We use the Google Doc for taking questions. Uh, so Julien will uh, we'll, uh, we'll take the stage now. Uh, you can put all your questions in the Google Doc. Uh, we will monitor them uh, and we'll, uh, we'll take them all. Julien, thank you. The stage is yours. Thank you, Martin, for this great introduction. So today we're going to talk about uh, containers and also Kubernetes because it's it's one of the questions I get the most often. And it's um, it, it's not because you're a student that you need to learn that. It's like many people in the industry also uh, come to me and ask me about those things. So I think it's a very good uh, initiative from KTH to teach that uh, early on. And so, hi, my name is Julien, I'm a software engineer. I specialize in Google Cloud and I have some uh, area of expertise and feel free to reach out to me if one of those, are, if you have question in one of those areas. So the, the presentation today, we're gonna start with a bit of a history about containers, how they came to be um, also, we're going to explore a little bit the technical details of the containers. Uh, we go I'm going to do a demo to see like hands-on how to use them. And then we're going to finish by uh, Kubernetes and why is it useful and why is it taken over the world. So a bit of history. Um, of course, at the beginning, there was before the containers, many things were just uh, VM. So virtual machines, and the the way the the IT infrastructure was working is that they had to order server, provision them, configure them, and then they could actually install a hypervisor on top of it. That hypervisor allowed to create more server onto one. So they had a much better usage of the hardware, meaning that they only had needed one server for many, uh, and they could spin up many VMs on top of it. And then came capacity planning because, you know, as, I don't know if you noticed, but the more, the more you use something, the more data you have in it. And so the data tends to grow. And uh, the more people use it also, the more resource it needs. And so you had to plan in advance, like sometimes years in advance, um, how much capacity do you need? And then came the, uh, a game that's called uh, right sizing. So compute density, imagine that if you have a one hardware server and you put four VM of uh, one gigabyte of memory on it, well, that four VM, they also have the operating system in it. So you, don't, you cannot really use that one gigabyte of memory because the, the operating system in it also use some memory. And so would it make sense to just make one big VM or, or for small or two half. And you know, the right sizing is that part, is tweaking those parameters, uh, the resource to be able to use the hardware that you that companies pay for the most um, in the most useful way. And of course, like this was the beginning of uh, you know the DevOps movement because on one side you had the operating uh, the sysadmin that was doing all the operation, managing the VM and even deploying. And on the other side, you had developers that knew nothing about what was going on in that world. And they were just uh, what we call throwing code over the wall, meaning that, well, uh, it works on my machine, here you go. Uh, you can deploy, Mr. Sysadmin, please send it to production. And I, I can tell you like firsthand, 
I, I remember a time where I had to put uh, the zip of my application onto an FTP server, send an email so that the person, when it feels like it, could take that, <laughs> that zip and deploy it to staging or production. So it was a really, really slow process. And if you get it wrong, you have to do it all over again. So it came with a, a bit of a problem so that everything is static. It means that basically you, you, you start to acc accumulating legacy. So everything is a little bit like, oh, this works that way and we cannot change it anymore. And so it becomes very much uh, like very like uh, difficult and hard to change and time consuming. Making an upgrade to an operating system was kind of like a, a lengthy process because we didn't have any redundancy. So we had to plan downtime and stuff. So it, it, it was not so really easy. Also the scaling, uh, if you need server today, um, back like let's say 10 years ago, you had to order the server and they come like six months later. So the capacity planning was a really, really important game that the companies needed to get it right. And it was really hard because the server were really expensive. And it started to change a little bit because the, the, the time of the employee become more expensive than the time of the machine. So, so those things are came together and that's why the, the containers took over the world. So now let's talk a bit about what is a container? Well, it's not really a VM, meaning that it's, it, does, it has some parts that are virtualized, but it's much more closer to the host operating system. Meaning that on the left side, if you can see, there is a virtual machine. You need to install an operating system. You need to install an hypervisor. And then inside the VM, you need an operating system as well. You need the dependency of your application and then you need your application. So there's a lot of layers of, of abstraction. The second thing about the VM is that once you allocate memory, CPU, disk, uh, whether the application use them or not, nobody else can use them. So it's very isolated. And that's very important because for security purposes or, or you know, ju just for the, the whole sake of knowing what is using what. The problem came because scaling was really hard. And so container came and you can see on the container side that it just has the operating system, the container engine, your dependency, the dependency of the application and the application. And there is very little that says um, you cannot, um, how can I explain? The container has access to whatever it's, it's the, the container engine allowed it to. So for instance, if you have um, four CPU and only uh, one, one of them needs three, it's totally fine. They can switch. And if one after a while, if another one needs more CPU while it's not used, the, the workload can shift very much. So that became really important because you could put a lot more application per server. So that reduced the cost and that eased the scaling a lot because those resources were, were kind of shared and we could just limit the, the, the resource that the, that the container used. For instance, we could limit how much CPU it used maximum, but below that it's all fine and all the resources are shared. So that, that became really why the container took over um, it's not like they replace VM because VM really have still a, a strong use case, but it became easily to pack more application into a, a single server. And so this container engine, what it uses is two features of the Linux kernel, the namespace, which is what the process can see, and the C group or the control group, which is what the process can use. And with those two, it's more like the application is still running like on the, on the operating system, but with a, sm uh, a lighter level of isolation. So if you have to explain to someone what is container, you have to start with, okay, you have a container image, which is basically a zip file of your application and its dependency. Then Docker is the program that runs that image. It, it knows how to execute that image. And each container live in their own namespace, meaning that unless you allow them to, a container will not write to the file system of another container. And, and that level of isolation became really, really relevant. So now we're gonna do a little demo. 
hopefully that will show you. So Docker is just a container engine that is the, is the fam most famous one, but it doesn't mean that it's like very user-friendly. There are many other ones uh, that can be used, but they are more for uh, high load and uh, like the, the API is, is a bit different. So if I just want to run a container, this is what I would do. And now I'm inside the container. So what can we do inside the container? Well, everything you can do inside a, a VM basically. So if you want to, we can install some software. It's gonna update, but if you see, like it's not installed on the host operating system. Oh, every time I get it wrong. Sorry, it's been. But it's not installed on the host operating system. And that brings that you, you can actually have more than one version of your application on the same machine. I don't know if you ever have to uh, combine different programming language, but the dependency get out of hand really fast uh, if you develop. And so what we can do is I can show you this process that's, uh, yeah, okay. So here, this is the, the host machine. This is inside the container. The host machine, you can see that actually it runs as root. So the benchmark that I'm running, you can see that process from the machine, but inside the container, you can only see its own processes. So that's why, that's the level of isolation that you can think about. And if I look into what the CPU is doing, it's exactly the same as the CPU of the, of the host machine. So it is very little to that, that change. It is just that you can say, okay, I can limit those into whatever I, I feel it needs and no more. Um, now I created a little bit, a little web server here, this SRV. You can see it starts on uh, port 8080. And if I curl it, or if I just, what it does, it just reply with the path and some variable that right now it cannot find. It will become relevant later. So the question becomes is now I have an application, how do I containerize it? And the way it's done, it's mainly by writing a um, Docker file. So what you define is which is the operating system or the base layer that you want, the directory you want uh, to start with. These are, I want to copy files from the host operating system to the container operating system. And I define an entry point, which is when you execute, execute that um, application. And we can do that very easily if I, uh, Sorry, no. Oh, I'm not in the right one. Sorry. So, Docker file. I will give it. Yes, authorize. So here, something interesting happened because what it does is it reads the it sends all the files that are in this directory so here i put the dot it sends all of that to the docker daemon which is gonna uh, start by creating layers for each of those commands a layer imagine is like a snapshot or a git commit of the file system and so now we can explore what that image is you see like i have one ubuntu which is the base one here and this one is the, my application. So if I just want to, actually I should give it a name. The way to give name is to tag them. So uh, yeah, SRV. And that should take very little time because you see caching is there. So there is exactly no, uh, no waiting time because Docker is smart enough to understand, okay, I already executed that command. I can use a cache to just move forward. But if somewhere along the line, the cache is uh, missed, 
then you start building again. So you, you have a faster development uh, process. And here, here is my image. So we can easily run it. Let's see if I, uh, if I just do this, it will run it, but I don't think I can, yeah, it says connection refuse. And that is because I didn't allow the container to use a port on the operating system. So let's see now, if I do P8080, 8080. So what I'm doing now is like, I want to allow the port on the host to be mapped to the port inside the container. Let's see now. All right. And now it works again. So from now we already uh, build an application. We containerize it and we give it access to the network. But I, there is something that always bother me is that the size of this image is a little bit big, I would say. And I'm sure you can, we can probably do something uh, cleaner because here it's a, it's a Go program. So there is not much, you know, it, it doesn't do anything. It's very, uh, it's 45 lines of Go. So that, that's really not much. And all it does is just copy the binary that is on the host inside the container. But what if I want to build that application inside the container, which is what most CI/CD um, pipeline does. So here we can use what we call multi-stage build. And the multi-stage build is that you can define a container that will be like used for building and we can base the, we can get the result of that build to a new, inside another container. So as you can see here, I'm gonna start with the Golang. I will name that, uh, that container builder. I will add the files and I will statically link it to become a single binary, meaning you don't need much. You don't need a lot of uh, dependency inside the container. And we're gonna try to run that and see the size of this. So I define, uh, and I can give it another name. And that will take a little bit longer and also will be a little bit, um, how can I say, heavier. But so as you can see here, what it does is it pulled the, the image called library slash Golang and this image become with many snapshots, uh, many layers. And those layers are each uh, a file system. Why do we do that? Is because those layers can be reused across many containers. So if you have two applications that share a layer, that layer on the disk is only counted once, which is a very a good uh, usage of the space. So you don't have any duplication. Now it's done. Let's see how much. So now my image is exactly seven megabyte. We went from 79 to seven megabyte. That's, that's almost a 90% you know, reduction in size. Uh, and what we can do now is, uh, let's see what I had prepared. Oh yeah, we can inspect that image. inspect search. And so that uh, gave a little bit more detail about what happened to, to that. You see here, the CMD is like the, the entry point is a server. So you can find some of those, uh, the, the detail that you define into the, the Docker file. So far so good, I don't see any question. All right, good. Um, what we have also is I can show you that the, the way to, the way to work with the, an image, it's, uh, it's actually literally like a zip file or a tar file, if you prefer. So you see this tar file, we can create a temporary 
directory, put it there, and we're gonna extract it. So now I can save my container as a file, you know, and that is much easier to, to deal with. So if I look what's inside, you can see that I have a, a layer tar. Inside that tar is the snapshot of the file system. So if you think about it, you sometimes need credentials for your application. And if you build it and you give those credentials inside your build, they will stay there. So if someone gets ac get access to your container, they will just go see through the layers and take your credentials from there. So those credentials are not uh, deleted, even if you delete it in, a, in another step. So that's very important for uh, security if you, if you have a need to do that. So that's a little bit about containers. We can move forward. Um, so this is it. This is why uh, containers are really useful. It's, it's fast to build. It's, you still need to uh, work on your application, meaning that, for instance, you, you might need to have some environmental variable that you need to pass. And logging should not be written to a file because the file system inside the container is not the file system in the host. So you, you cannot easily get those logs. The best way to log is through the, is the standard output. And that allows for a very easy reproducible, reproducible build because you have the build cache. And so you, you can easily iterate and faster. Of course, the more you put, the slower it's gonna get. But you can think of it as, okay, it's lightweight VM and they share, they can share resources much easier. But what if you have two VM and you have some container on one and some other container there? How would you know what's running? You would have to go inside one VM, list all the containers. You have to go to the other, list all the containers and decide, you know, where, should, where do I have enough resources? Where should, do I have space? And that's where this scheduling problem is interesting. Um, and that's exactly what Kubernetes solved, among other things, of course. Actually, Kubernetes solved all of those things on the screen. But we're going to mainly focus on the scheduling part. So a little bit of a Kubernetes demo. We can uh, see, so how would you deploy? Um, actually, I should not start with that. Kubernetes, if you think about it, it's a database. And the way it works is that you see you have your two VM and how would you know what's running in there? You would have to have a script or a program that just continuously lists what, what are the container running inside those VMs. And that will send that data back somewhere to be stored. Otherwise you would have, you would have the same problem. They are just inside the VM. And that database, that stored that state, this is how Kubernetes work, basically. Kubernetes, think of it as a database that you can interact with. And by putting some data into the database, things happen magically behind the scene. And there is actually, um, a process, a process that continually checked what is the state of the cluster, so meaning all the VMs, and what is the state that the developer wants to see happen. That process is called reconciliation. And it's a very common, you can create your own, you can uh, tune in. They come, Kubernetes come with some pre-built one, but the easiest way to, to show is uh, if I do, Okay, so I already have an application running, but I, I would like to send my application, like the one that I just built, the one that is um, seven megabytes. So for that, I need a, Docker, a container registry. Thankfully, you're in the cloud, there is one for you. Every major like cloud provider has a container registry. And the way uh, Google, <laughs> the one on Google Docs uh, work, is basically you have to give it a nice name. 
So if I go back to, I can do Docker tag. Uh, I don't remember exactly the, yes, okay. I didn't help myself. Okay, that's a little bit. Docker tag, we're gonna take this image ID. We're gonna call it with the name of the project, which is KTA Demo 2021. We're gonna call it SRV, done. There. So you see they have the same ID, the same ID, but different name. And this one, I can easily send it. And that's interesting because if you look at it, it says layer already exists. And what that means is that that layer is already on the registry. So you don't need to push it. You save network bandwidth. Um, so now it's, it's sent. Let's see where it goes. So here I'm in the container registry and there it is. It's very easy. You can see like there is a shot. You can have the deploy command if you want, or the pull command if you want the, your coworkers to, to share it. It's quite convenient. I would need just the, the shot of this. So now that I have Kubernetes, Kubernetes is really good at those things. Kubernetes is very good at deploying things. You see, I already have some deployment. Here, I'm gonna delete it. Okay, and now I, I don't have anything running on the cluster. And the good thing is that there is a tree, tree VM used for this cluster, but I don't know which one this container is using. I can specify one, but I, I don't really want to care. I just want to my, my application to run. So what I do is I create what we call the manifest. That manifest is done through YAML. And that's how you interact with the database of Kubernetes. You, you just write a descriptive language, which is, hey, I, I have a deployment that has a, that I want three of that application, three container running, um, I want to take, I want you to take my image, which is the one that is here. Oh boy, what did I do? Not sure that's the correct one. Let's see. There. So now I'll specify, okay, I have my image. I want you to, to use that image to be deployed. I have some port that it should have open. Here are some resource. So I just need two, 32 megabytes of memory, but in case I want you to limit to 64. Uh, same for the CPU. And here are some interesting facts about Kubernetes is that you have what we call a downward API meaning that you can make an application aware of where it's running. So I want to know like where it's running. I want to know its name. I want to know which namespace. I want to know its IP and I want to know its service account, meaning the, the credential that this, this application has. Uh, we can, what we can do now is actually deploy. So how do you deploy to Kubernetes? Very easy. And there, I deploy my application. This is much easier than pushing a zip to a FTP server and sending, sending an email. I can tell you that much. Um, so let's see, what, how do we know? Like, is it running? Okay, I see it's running. I want to know, like, perfect. Everything seems to run now. How, how do I reach my application? 
And this is where it gets complicated because you're like, oh, yeah. and so the way it works is you have to set up the networking. Now, we don't have the time here to set up a load balancer and expose, and I have to teach you about ingress and all those things, but we can go, we can cheat a little bit. So what we need to do is to create a service to expose that port that we define here. So this port 8080, we can, we can see that it's not exposed here. So the way networking works is that you, on Kubernetes is by using services. And you can see that I already have one here um, that is exposed. So if I use this IP, it will reach the port, the container. But how come? Because I have three containers. And so that's, that's the beauty of Kubernetes is that it creates all of those things uh, for you, all those abstractions for you. So you, you can focus on your application, not so much on the details of how how do I talk to my application? But the problem is this IP is a non-rotable IP. This is a, it's called a private network. So either you expose it or you route a request from the, uh, the internet inside the cluster, or you actually go inside the cluster and query from there, which is much easier than, uh, <laughs> than actually exposing it. Let's see. I have this one that can be useful. So what I'm doing here is, it's like, I, it's the same of SSHing. Like this is what I do. I create a, class, um, a pod that we call, which is a container, one or many container. And you can see that I'm here. So now I have, I'm running inside the container and I have access to a shell in there. So what, what can we do here? I guess we have access to Google. Ah, curl not found, of course. Uh, we use, we get, it's all right. Yeah, so we have access to the internet. That's great. But now I want to know what is the IP. This one. So there. And here we go. So now I, I have built my application. I have trimmed down uh, all the things that I don't need by using a multi-stage build. I have created a deployment manifest for my application on Kubernetes. I've deployed it. I've exposed it through a service so that it can load balance between them. And now I can query my application. As you can see, the name of this pod is, SR, is S2C44. S2C44 is this one. And we can easily like uh, have some fun and do exactly what we did, but just a little bit more like with more repetition. And now you can see that the IP and the name change. So this is what the load balancing, there is three, three containers running and it's just querying each one of them. So now the scaling becomes so much easier. And if I want, I can just edit the deployment and say, okay, I want, I want eight of them. All right. And they are there. So now it's gonna, and the, the best part is that I keep querying that uh, service endpoint it will load balance through all eight of them. So this is how scaling is done. I think we've, I've done enough because I can really spend a lot of time on Kubernetes. We're gonna stop the, the, the demo here, but this is what you need to visualize is that Kubernetes, it's a database with a controller that check the state of the cluster and reconcile it with the state the developer wants to see. 
And the all, all that uh, is the, it's really the base of what you, you need to understand. That database is actually called etcd. So it's a distributed key value store. And distributed meaning that it's a database that can live on more than one host, on more than one machine. And so that's, that scales pretty well as well, because if you have like three, uh, three machine and you have a, the database on three, what prevents you to add like 10 or 20 more uh, hosts? And that can handle a lot of load. So that's Kubernetes in a nutshell. Now, Kubernetes is not so much a sing, the silver bullet. Uh, it has things that it doesn't want to, to care about. Like it, it's for you to figure out, like where do the logs go? Now, of course, if you use a cloud provider, they solve that most of that for you. It, it's like uh, they provide a service you just need to pay. Um, but other than that, it's many things that are completely done. And I highly, highly suggest that you, you study a little bit the, the, the design of the API of Kubernetes. It's pure genius. I, I mean, I'm really impressed by how well they design it, how well it scales. Okay, but now we have like, we've talked about compute, memory, storage, networking. What, what, what's missing? What, what would you say was not there? And that's security. I, I want to emphasize this because making things work is not enough. Um, you, you actually need to secure things. And the reason I say that is because in the last few months, there've been so many data, data breach or, you know, th these are people data, these are, you know, these are your friends, these are your family that are using some, some of the service that use those technology and, and the data gets leaked and they get spam or they get scammed. And that's really um, what I want you to remember from this is that making it work is not enough. You, you, need to, you need it to be secure a little bit. And learning about security is very important, not for your job or your career, but for society, because those things happen whether you want it or not. And so this is the end of the presentation. Thank you. And because I wrote way too much code in my career, I would like to apologize to everyone who has to maintain it. And I hope that you've learned more by maintaining it than by me by writing it. Thank you very much. I'm going to jump into the question now. Uh, is the manifest YAML file an implementation of the known concept as infrastructure as code? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I really understand the question. Um, is the manifest YAML file? So basically, YAML is just a, a declarative language, right? You, you can use JSON, you can use like TOML or wh whatever descriptive language you, you want. Infrastructure as code is more like you, you have what is in the, in the cloud uh, in code. Doesn't matter what code it is because you have things like Pulumi. Pulumi, you can use Go, Python, the TypeScript. So YAML is a little bit like, a, it's just a useful language. Is the, no, I wouldn't say it's uh, infrastructure as code. I wouldn't say it's called infrastructure as code because this is not infrastructure, it's deployment. The, the, the YAML manifest is about the deployment. So with the increased usage of cloud, something people are often worried about is dependency on the cloud provider. Do you believe that the user of the current Kubernetes can somewhat avoid that dependency? So that's a really good question. And I, I have to say like, you, I don't know of a company that use one single cloud. So they have multi-cloud, whether they know it or not. It, it's, it's really true. And as, as I told you, if I show you here the, so this is the, the things that Kubernetes is not solving for you. So you still need to figure those things out. And usually it's by a cloud provider. So unless you want to create your own abstraction of everything, <laughs> the, the time you're gonna spend with that is probably not worth the money you're gonna give to a cloud provider. So that's really depends. I, I would say that it helps, but in, in practice, you're still very much dependent to a cloud provider. Now, that doesn't mean that you cannot move you have to balance that into, okay, how much would it cost us to move 
if the cloud provider do something that we don't like or versus like, okay, how fast can we ship features? So it's a trade-off. You have to know that trade-off. And I cannot answer that in, in, in the absolute. You, you need to go with the use case. Can you show some of the command file again so we can screenshot it? <laughs> I can, I can uh, send you the file, no worries. Uh, I, I'll post it in the chat. Do you have a, a preference for GCP? Yes, very much. <laughs> I don't know what gave that away, but uh, yes, I, I, I dedicated my, my career to learning one cloud really well. And I think it paid out a lot more that if I just try to learn every cloud a little bit. So I, I'd rather be good at one thing than average or even not so good at, at many. Uh, fun question as, <laughs> damn it, I cannot read. A uh, funny question, as a talent engineer, do you have an opinion on Palantir? Absolutely not. Um, I never used it. I, I heard of it, but uh, sorry about that. Um, I'm, I cannot answer that uh, question uh, with the knowledge I have. Uh, what is your advice in terms of security? What are the most important practice in your opinion? Well, th that's a very good question because I think we, we don't start enough with security in mind. So it's more like, who should have access to what I'm gonna build is would be like a really good question. And the problem with that is like every requirements in IT really is that those requirements change and they might change. And I, I feel like that's also one big lock, lockout of the, of the cloud is that their security model will lock you out. It's not so much that, you know, Kubernetes or, or Docker or those containers, that's, that's just compute, but security, Try to try to translate like from one cloud to another is like such a tremendous project that it's um, it's a very very costly uh, endeavor and I would say that that's that's the first thing you should figure out is how do we secure well like how do we want to manage access and that that will that question alone you might not have the answer but that question alone will lead you to a path where you much more confident about how to go about security. And, and, and that makes it easier because, you know, there's only two types of company. There's those that's been hacked and those who don't know they've been hacked. So the, the rest is a little bit like, uh, you, we have to be humble and just do, do our best about securing. Doesn't mean that you have to go full on and lock down everything. Uh, there's a lot of movement. If you use Kubernetes and multiple cloud providers, can you guarantee single source of truth? Um, it depends on which uh, abstraction you're talking about, about single source of truth. Usually a deployment is not atomic. So by, by the time you say, I want to deploy to it's running in production, th th there is always some gap there. So th there is always discrepancy, you know, especially whatever, you know, infrastructure as code or the, the, the problem is the feedback loop. Like it takes time to create those resources and that time can really be like deadly sometimes. Uh, that's why we, it is the same as, um, as a pull request that needs to be small, that to, to incrementally build uh, change and be, make sure that everything goes smoothly. But if you do a big bang change and something goes wrong, you have to go through all of the change to see which one cause. And that's much more time consuming. So if you mean like, uh, the single source of truth is your deployment manifest. Uh, sure, why not? Um, yeah, you can, you can guarantee that with Kubernetes. Now it can be uh, like everything distributed, right? And if you want to know more about distributed, this is the Bible. This is like the book for distributed system. This is like one of the best thing. I, I, I think it should be really, uh, everyone should read it if you're interested in distributed system because so many things can go wrong. And they, at least this book teach you about the trade-offs. Very good. Um, so I'm looking at, at time. Uh, so I think, I think we will officially take the break. Uh, and before that, so I would like to thank you, Julien, very, very much for, for, for giving this uh, 45 minutes uh, deep dive into, into the cloud. Uh, and I fully agree with you uh, that uh, specializing in one technology and being being an expert and, and among the best in one is excellent. It's a very good uh, very good choice. 
and we would very much recommend uh, to all the students to do the same. Pick your pick the technology you prefer and become become a world expert. So that's a, that's a very good piece of advice. Um, if there are still some questions, feel free to put them in the Google Doc. Julien may answer uh, uh, by, by writing. Uh, Julien, is that okay for for you if students contact you over LinkedIn or? Uh, of course, or... of course, please feel free. That's why I put my contact. You have my website. There is my information. Shoot those questions uh, any any way you can reach me. I, I'll do my best to answer. Excellent. So Julien, thank you very much. Many, many, many thanks. Uh, for being uh, here uh, present for the third time the KTH DevOps course. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor. And as, as you know, uh, we used to have this uh, DevOps dinner with all guest lecturers uh, sometime in the future. Uh, and we will very much, uh, we will very much look forward to, to have this dinner with you. Um, 